My colleague uh, Andrew Mitchell joins us from Washington, D.C. And Andrew, I just want to get your reaction generally to, to what you heard over the course of that, that news conference. I keep going back to what yeah. Kelly O'Donnell said uh, just a moment ago. We didn't have the opportunity to hear many questions from uh, reporters with U.S. media outlets. Uh, he, he fielded a lot of questions from uh, reporters from other regional outlets who were there in Hanoi for that, for that news conference. But let's talk about testing. Uh, I played a bit of tape just a moment ago with the president talking about the commitment that the, the North Korean leader made to him. And that makes me get to this point. That is, what's your sense of, of the, the relationship between these two leaders at the, at the end of this summit? Um, there was a positive spin, a positive sheen at the beginning. Uh, then there was that memorable line from President Trump at the beginning of this news conference in reference to Kim Jong-un. He's quite a guy, quite a character. Uh, speak to that, if you would, just the relationship between these two leaders and the degree which that's driving whatever comes next here. Well, it probably shouldn't, because I, my takeaway is that for all the reliance on personal diplomacy and all the things the president said about a love affair, uh, perhaps jokingly in that, in that rally in West Virginia, and talking about the letters, showing off his letters, the pen pal relationship, when it gets down to the nuts and bolts of nuclear disarmament, it's very complicated. And what they ran into today is exactly that point. It was very clear, in fact, in a question from uh, our colleague David Sanger at the New York Times, that the U.S. revealed that it knows more than has been acknowledged and that North Korea has acknowledged about their nuclear program. That they may not know everything, it's a very hard intelligence target, but they knew that there is more than just Young Beyond, the massive facility where there's uranium and plutonium uh, enrichment and uh, a lot of other developments and that the North Koreans have been talking to the U.S. about dismantling. That it goes beyond that, that they needed to have more and when the U.S. clearly in these talks uh, revealed that they know a lot more Beyond that, uh, that they, there was no way that the president and Pompeo were going to go along with uh, sanctions relief just on the basis of some dismantling of Young Bion. Uh, we've come so far from the declarations post-Singapore that there would be complete denuclearization, that there would be an inventory. Mike Pompeo stepped in to say that we still do not have that list. And that list, that inventory of the arsenal that they have, the, not only the weapons that they already developed, but what they are still developing, that is what has to precede any kind of agreement on denuclearization. We have to know what they've got. They have to acknowledge what they've got before you can even start negotiating on inspections and everything else that both Victor and Wendy sitting next to you know they have to do as arms negotiators. So they didn't even get to that stage. And that says that this was a real failure but I think the success is that they didn't try to gloss it over, that they did walk away. The worst case would have been if they tried to say that there was a deal and have a signing ceremony that really was an empty gesture. Uh, that recognition of the growth of that arsenal coming uh, as a result of that sharp line of questioning from David Sanger, uh, as you mentioned there, and it also elicited some comments on multilateralism uh, as well. President Trump saying that on the heels of this news conference, he's going to get on the plane and he's going to call uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He's going to speak with uh, President Moon Jae-in of, of South Korea uh, as well. Help us understand that context, uh, if you would, Andrea, here. You have man-to-man uh, -man diplomacy, personal diplomacy, as we were talking about just a few moments ago, uh, within a lot of global interest. Um, how are those two countries, how are Japan, how is uh, South Korea going to react to what they saw unfold in Hanoi over the last 36 hours? Well, I would suspect that Japan might be encouraged, South Korea might be, uh, at least President Moon in South Korea, might be disappointed because he's been pushing for more engagement. He wanted some sanctions relief to at least permit a North-South economic uh, re relations to be reestablished in a much broader way. Uh, that most likely will not happen if the president holds firm to the fact that there will be no sanctions relief. Uh, both China and Russia, we believe, have been cheating on the sanctions, easing off after Sang Singapore because of all of the suggestions from President Trump that things were going, going swimmingly. They uh, found a lot of loopholes, we believe, to, mm. to back off on sanctions relief. So uh, well, that's one thing. One other thing that I thought uh, might be disturbing to South Korea and to the U.S. military is the president casting shade on the joint military exercises. He freelanced the suspension of military exercises in Singapore, much to the uh, dismay of then you know, Defense Secretary General Mattis. Those are key to readiness, so they usually take place every spring. And he said that they would be suspended. When asked about them, he said, you know, they're a waste of money. They cost $100 million. We don't get reimbursed. War games are nice. Uh, we play war games. He really 
diminish the importance of those joint military exercises, mm. which are very important for readiness to both sides. And now there's a real question as to whether they will take place. He did not acknowledge a recent agreement with South Korea where they increased their share. There is reimbursement uh, to the tune of almost a billion dollars. And he didn't acknowledge mm. that at all. So he, he seemed to be, again, diminishing the importance of those military exercises. And I think he, th he might be urged to clarify that when he does talk to South Korea. We're watching that presidential motorcade making its way uh, to the airport. Andrea, let me ask you lastly, just for your observations of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, you cover the State Department day in uh, and day out. You've traveled with the Secretary of State. Um, we saw, in my estimation, a chastened Secretary of State standing next to President Trump uh, on the stage at that hotel in, in Hanoi. He said, we wanted to take a big step. Uh, we made real progress. We didn't get all the way. Uh, and we heard, reiterated from the Secretary of State, what we heard in advance of this summit, um, that this is going to take time. This has become something that we have heard over and over again now from this administration, a uh, re-envisioning uh, of how long this process is going to take. I think it's, it's been a real disappointment. Mike Pompeo was the point person. We began to see after Singapore when he went to Pyongyang and did not even get a meeting with Kim Jong-un. Uh, so they've been really dragging their feet, and, and Pompeo's been trying to pull it along the way. Uh, his top negotiator, Steve Began, his, his envoy, gave a speech, an important speech at Stanford University on the way, the run-up to the summit. Uh, which probably should not have been scheduled. It was premature, clearly, as Victor Cha has said. And Began said, you know, we have to get uh, a roadmap coming out of this next summit as to the next steps. They don't have that roadmap, and they don't yet have the accounting of the weapons, the arsenal that we've been reporting and others have been reporting, has been expanding since Singapore. Uh, so in answer to one of the questions that was asked to the president today, what about the fact that they are still expanding their arsenal, even as we're, you're supposedly negotiating, and there was no clear answer about that. Uh, they don't have a freeze on the weapons program. They don't even have an accounting. So I don't know how Pompeo proceeds, but this could be a sticky, a sticky moment. Do they revert to the very, uh, to the happy talk? Do they work through this relationship because there still is the, the carrot out there, the economic sanctions being lifted? Or does Kim Jong-un revert to to a, a harder line publicly and privately. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.